Hi, uh, welcome to this very first Mission Initiative Group Roundtable. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, three guests with us today who are going to share their wisdom and their knowledge and, well, whatever else they've got to, uh, we'll take whatever they'll give us. Uh, but we really are here today to have a conversation about how the church has responded in, its, in the current crisis and how we begin to think about how we move forward into the future. So, without further ado, our guests, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Andy, if I could start with you. Yeah. Hi, guys. So, I'm Andy. I am executive pastor at Central, which is a Baptist church in Edinburgh. So, we're like every church trying to work out what is church in the season and find it both a real exciting opportunity, but also have its challenges, like I'm sure it is for you guys. And I also oversee a youth event called PowerPoint, which is events in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen. And then I have two boys and a wife and learning very fast how to homeschool pretty badly, to be honest. But that's also another little <laughs> trick I've got on my sleeve at the moment. So, yeah, great Brilliant. to be here. Brilliant. And Kaz? Hey, yeah, I'm Kaz um, and I'm pastor for Youth, Young Adults and Integration at Queen's Park Baptist Church in Glasgow. Um, so my role involves a lot of working with kind of 11 to 25, 11 to 30 year olds and new people around the church and obviously this is a really interesting season for that, trying to work out who is new um, and how people are connecting and then how we help people connect within that as well. Um, I'm in quite a different situation to Andy, I live on my own um, and so I'm navigating this um, in my own space, um, on my own, um, so not having to balance things like homeschooling, but um, a few different challenges along the way at the moment. Great. Thanks, Kaz. And Martin, who are you? Hi, I'm Martin. I'm the General Director of the Baptist Union of Scotland. That's our, our network of 160 or so churches. I've been in leadership in Baptist churches for many years. And um, at the moment, the Baptist Union centrally is trying to be the best resource we can be to churches around the country in these changing times. And also, I'm trying to notice what is going on in all the different places. I, I live at home with, uh, in, uh, just in Octorod near Perth. My wife's here and my grown-up son and daughter-in-law are with us at the moment. And it's a, it's a busy house with four adults all trying to work in the same space. Right. And I should say, I'm Glenn Innes. I'm the chair of the Mission Initiative Group of the Baptist Union. I'm the pastor at Portobello Baptist Church in Edinburgh. I am married uh, to a doctor, and uh, she's obviously at work. So I have a 13-year-old daughter who is uh, thankfully very self-reliant uh, on her teaching because I'm not convinced at all homeschooling <laughs> would be my thing. But uh, but we're getting there. Nobody's killed one another yet, so we're, we're, we're really very happy with that. Uh, thanks everyone and thanks for giving us your time. We should say today is the 11th of May, uh, so if you're watching this in the future, uh, maybe next week, then everything might be different, but uh, for today our conversation makes sense. That's, uh, that's kind of where we're at. So um, we, what we want to do over the next half hour or so is have a conversation uh, with you guys about what your experience has been of uh, this time and then particularly uh, later we'll begin to think about how you're thinking about what might come next. So I guess if we could just kick it off, Kaz, maybe you could talk to us about how how have you and your church experienced the shift in gathering practices during lockdown? Um, and I'm particularly concerned with maybe how you've experienced it rather than specifically what you've done, though it might be helpful to let us know what you've been doing. Yeah, I think um, probably just to start with, actually, Glenn, I pick up on Andy's comment about some good things and some not so good things, some things that are positive and some not so. Um, I think for us, normally we are um, a large gathered church um, in Scotland and um, a lot of what we do centres around a kind of a Sunday gathering with people coming from across the city um, to be in one space. Now, that's obviously definitely not happening right now so it's been about how do we how do we create something that picks up on all the things that we normally would have on a, on a Sunday and in those other spaces um, and for us that's actually been a really big challenge how do we do it in a way that is not distant from people um, 
so how do we do something that's interactive, that keeps people engaged, and um, that doesn't become a bit of consumer culture? Um, because that's one of our biggest fears in all of this is that it becomes very easy to become even more of a consumer culture than I think we would have said we had already. Do you know, um, sitting at home in your pajamas on the sofa watching church on a Sunday where somebody's done it earlier in the week and recorded it and maybe you just feel very excluded from it. We just, that was our opinion that wasn't going to work for us as a church. Um, and so we've tried to create something that's much more interactive. And what we're loving in the midst of this, one of the positives, is the level of interaction we're seeing. Um, we were the kind of church, and maybe this is something other people were experienced, but the kind of, th kind of church where regular attendance was once a fortnight, not once a week. Um, for some, it was even less than that. Um, and suddenly we've got people joining with us every week again. That wasn't, that's not happened for a long time. Um, we've got people who are desperate to come and join a midweek prayer meeting online. Um, do you know our, our first midweek prayer meeting, we had over 100 people involved in that. I don't know when we last had over 100 people at a midweek prayer meeting. Um, but actually just even seeing that continue and the passion and the heart for that continue. But it's been about keeping things interactive. So not just about providing something that we had, like we do for people, but how do we get people involved? So I think that's probably been our biggest challenge. Yeah, so just quickly, how have you done that? I mean, what does that look like? So for us, number one, it means Sunday is live, like 100% live, um, with all the ups and downs that being live contains. Um, so we do, our pastors gather together on a platform like this, um, and then we live stream it on YouTube. Um, but we keep the chat feature open, and we then include what is coming in on the chat into what we're doing. So questions, comments, all of that, we then feed that into the online live conversation. So if, um, we're also making sure that on a Thursday before we're sending out an email saying this is what our topic's gonna be this week, reflect on it, think about it, send us some thoughts and try and include them in it. But then also people have had a chance to think about it. They're putting more stuff in on a Sunday and then we can just kind of share that with our online prayer we're doing exactly the same thing but going around different houses a bit kind of how the Baptist Union were doing it unashamedly stole their model um, um but then leaving space for people to write up their own prayers um on the chat as well and then even just feeding some of that into the conversation as we Kaz, can I ask Kaz is the, the the chat on YouTube has that been largely constructive or a mix I'm just interested what reflections you've had on there and obviously it does give space for trolls to be chipping away as well yeah we've not actually thankfully not experienced any of that Andy um I would say the first I'd say your I'll first get, I'll get first... on board on Sunday yeah, yeah. <laughs> watching out for you yeah. I'm usually the one picking up the feedback <laughs> <laughs> the first 15 minutes is everybody saying hello to each other mm. um but that's really helpful for us because we can see who's there because lots of people are saying hey we're here and this is who's with us um but as we get into the conversation, more and more, we found the last couple of weeks, people sharing prophetic words, um, sharing Bible verses. We had an interview with a couple of our leaders this week, um, live on the chat, and people responding to the word that they brought in that as well, um, and actually kind of adding to that. And so we were able to kind of work through that as a church, um, which normally we can't do on a Sunday morning, but I actually feel like almost like there's something extra in, in this space. I don't know how you find it, Andy, because you're, obviously like a large church like we are and um, how you're kind of finding that aspect finding what the sunday experience or yeah yeah so we've done it all pre-recorded thus far which has been good i think we've done that for a number of reasons we have a weekly prayer gathering on wednesday which like you's been really significant again 100 people or so and for them that's probably been their favorite interaction the week and it's the most easy to put on it's literally a zoom call and a chance to pray for anything from the NHS to how we do church to our alpha courses. So that's been really significant. The pre-recorded stuff's been good. And I think we've done that just because of the sort of safety in terms of technology and the fact that we can be happy about, I guess, what we're putting out there on Sunday. And I think we also just want to continue to value communities. One of the strengths that we found is that last year we really invested in our missional communities. We want to be a church about missional communities and we're just really grateful we did spend a year really investing in them and allowing the leaders to be self-starters encouraging them to be the core of what we do and it's been quite interesting as well because one of two people who have made noise about the fact that 
communities aren't what they want to be part of and now turning a corner and desperate to be part of community because they realize that's what's really holding the church together but because of the strength of the communities in the last year or so i would say it's been really encouraging to see that many people have valued that as much as the sunday if not more so we do want to be having a space on sunday where there's good worship there's teaching there's input there's a sense of family we also want to make sure that actually in terms of life in terms of supporting one another in terms of mission that's all done through the weekly communities on zoom and the other thing that's worth saying is this sunday we've launched our central families online i wasn't really that involved but it's been absolutely brilliant it's been interesting to see one or two school teachers who clearly have a bit much a lot of time on their hands going the absolute extra mile to make this hilariously brilliant central online families thing and it's been great as well to see lots of different faces involved a bit like you Kaz, we've heard that the church is valued seeing different faces from the congregation at this time so the 10 30 to 11 gives a chance for different ages and stages just to show face have different interviews and actually it's probably more possible in that space than it is between t- uh, 11 and 12 so that's been really significant as well i, I think it's really interesting andy and kaz you both talk mainly about the relationality the re- kind of relationship building side of this and i think you know that's so interesting because i mean the the kind of teaching from the bible we, we, we you know we've got we've got different models of doing that and that seems to kind of flow quite easily and um maybe maybe we've mostly decided that um, singing along is, is is a bit of an acquired taste <laughs> although you know what worship this kind of perform can be really uplifting because i think that's what struck me in 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 the church i belong to perth we've got a a, a pattern of um of pre-recorded video um uh, services on Sunday, which which are really high standard, and I, I've, I've been enriched by them in so many ways. And, but I think part of the genius of it is there's been a lot of going into different people's homes, and I feel like I've met people in a different way because I've mm. seen them doing some of their stuff in their homes, and there's been some really good family stuff edited in from that. And uh, and and actually, yeah, for me that's been one of the best things. This last Sunday, I was speaking at a different church who do worship by Zoom. There was a guest of church of about seventy people on the Zoom call, and I must. I, admit, I, I loved the, the, the sense of immediacy of being connected in that moment, um, although it was nothing like as slick as what I've grown accustomed to. There was something very special about being connected and then being put into a chat room afterwards to have coffee with people I'd, uh, I'd not met before. It was actually, I, I, that was, that was a, a kind of refreshing moment <laughs> of relationality as well, in it? So, I mean, if someone was just listening to this in a bubble, they might think we're all dead happy about this because we're all telling these great stories, and that and that's really good. But but it has been challenging, and we have lost things in the midst of uh, this uh, time. So, I, I mean, I wonder if you could just take a couple of minutes and reflect maybe on some of the things that you think you've lost as uh, as uh, congregations, as, as communities, or in Martin's case, uh, as a union from uh, in this time. Andy, how about you go first with that one? Yeah, so I think it's worth saying, isn't it, that almost on a weekly basis, you recognise the pain and the hardship of this season and you hear about someone passing away or you hear about someone losing a job and you realise it's incredible, incredibly difficult and challenging. But equally, what an opportunity it is. And I found it also really exciting to reimagine church, to think about the mission opportunity. And, and I think both truths are very real at the same time and that's quite hard to navigate actually and any given Sunday you might be talking to people who are loving life and really positive but equally people who are struggling because they've just lost their job or their family situation dire so it's a real tension that but I think in terms of where we are as a church what's been interesting I guess across the UK is this has been a real leveler whether you're a church of 8,000 or a church of 20 in a matter of weeks you've had to redesign church and work out what church is and what you value and what you go for, what structures and programs you need. And I think it's been interesting to see every church across the nation have to battle that. I suppose my biggest fear for churches would be that the kind of consumer culture or comparison culture, which Kaz was alluded to, would would take place. And the danger, I guess, is that you can pick your favourite worship or your favourite teaching from any church across the UK. And as Martin says, miss out on that relational aspect which is so important and that real doing life together because whether your church has got excellent teaching or excellent worship really it's not about that it's about the family on mission together so I think that's the danger alongside that I think there's a challenge to churches to avoid the comparison trap and say okay God what is it you've got for me in this season what is it that you want us to be and our distinctive because the reality is is that 
we shouldn't all try and imitate HTB or whatever church seems to be doing great stuff because we've got different calls and different graces on our churches. So I think avoiding the comparison, avoiding the bigger churches modeling how we should be doing churches and actually what is our distinctive? What is it that we should be going after? Because the danger is then you get qualms and complaints about the fact of the stuff they're seeing in other churches and not seeing in your church. And that could be all well and good because that's what you've gone after, but it's not meeting their consumer needs, if we're honest. And I suppose the other fear I'd have, Glenn, which is slightly different, would be around the fact we have to listen in this time, we have to listen to God. I think it would be a disaster, to put it bluntly, if we don't respond to what God is asking of us in this time. And I realise the irony of this statement, but I'm concerned about the amount of TED Talks and webinars and emails I get saying these are 10 ways to sort out your church and these are the 15 things you'll do and sort your church out. And I realise the irony about talking about <laughs> this right now. But I think the main thing I would want our church to do and the main thing I'd encourage churches to do is to listen and to pray and to wait on God and ask, what is he saying? I know that's so obvious, but we can't just think, right, as soon as possible, we're going to go back to how we were. That just cannot be an option. This is allowing a monumental shift in how we do church and what our missiology is, what our ecclesiology is, what we're going after, what we should be, what we could be. And I think it would be pretty devastating to say, we got through that, let's just go back and revert to what we were. And alongside that is around the fact that we've really learned that actually we can be really adaptable and we can change pretty quick. So if and when we do start to begin to think what returning to gathered church looks like or how we respond given that lockdown comes to its end, and I think we have to think, okay, we are adaptable, we are nimble, and therefore it's not just about replacing vehicles for the next 10 years, it's about having an adaptability for months and then reevaluating and working out what the next few months after that look like and being responsive to a mission opportunity rather than saying, here's the next five to 10 years, and this is our strategy, let's go for it. Brilliant. Andy, there's so much in there. I, I actually want to bring Martin in because, Martin, before even this, any of this started, uh, I, I've heard you talk a number of times about um, if, if we're really Baptist churches being driven by local uh, local concerns, then why is it uh, that we all look exactly the same? And and I, I hear Andy talking about a couple of things there in terms of listening to the voice of God, about understanding our own sense of uh, calling and not just copying what other people are doing, trying to be the best consumer. How does all that tie together for you with a kind of more national picture uh, in your mind? I think what Andy's saying is is spot on that there isn't a way out of this in unison for all of us and a few people have been saying to me you know what, what's the Baptist Union telling us about what we should do after after this and yet the answer is exactly listen to God mm -hmm. but also I think part of that listening that Andy's just describing includes an openness to let go of things Mm -hmm. um, and we might, you know, we have a very Sunday centric model of church. I doubt that many of our churches will close down Sunday, but I think there are big questions to ask about how much our life needs to be and should be centered around Sunday. We have gatherings in most of our churches where a monologue by an individual from a lectern is a very big part of the gathering. And I've been interested to see, you know, in our uh, digital expressions of church, that it seems that we can teach the word of God in, in, on the whole, quite a lot of, quite, quite, quite a shorter time than we've been in, accustomed to elsewhere. Now, we, you know, there's something to learn from that. Or indeed, you know, what you were saying, Kaz, you know, about how we keep that interactive and, and gain the benefits from that. I, th I think these things are... Uh, uh, are pretty important. Also, I mean, I've noticed, you know, that the, the, um, the, the worship gatherings ha have, actually, I think, become more multi-voiced through the creativity we've used in being separate. And I think Andy's point, you know, about how agile we are, how uh, how um, able to change we are when we put our minds to it, is something that we've got to keep telling ourselves. We are not conservative. We're not some conservative institution that struggles to change. Yeah. We can really change. And if we just grasp what the Spirit of God is saying about the new kind of phase, I'll probably at some point say something more about the, the, the digital opportunities, but I'll, I'll stop talking about that just for now. <laughs> yeah, Kaz, I, I wonder about you, and I wonder if we might just jump off the back of that and begin to shift it towards how do you see us or what in your heart is being stirred for how we 
move forward from here? You know, we've heard some of what Andy and Martin were saying there, but what, what in your context and, in, and, and what God's been speaking to you about, do you see as some of the kind of major shifts that you think we'll see in church locally, but also in church leadership and perhaps especially in mission? Um, I think off the back of what Andy was saying about us not just being about comparison, mm. we've talked about it for a while, but I think it's an extra kick in the, the area of authenticity. Mm. Do you know, if we can't be authentic to who we are called to be, if we can't be authentic to who God calls us as communities to be, then what are we doing? Because actually, do you know, it's not it's not going to bring people to Jesus if we're not truly who we are called to be. Um, and I think just more and more that's been stirred up in me. And actually that's, that was again, a, that was a word we actually received as a church on Sunday as well was about this authenticity. And every time I hear the word authenticity, I'm brought back to a moment at a pre cred conference two years ago. And I think it was Aaron Elder, but he was quoting somebody and I have no idea who he was quoting. Um, but he, he said, authenticity um, is the apologetic of today. So if we want to actually be ready to share faith with people, if we want to be able to speak into people's lives, we need to be authentic. Um, and I think we are we are so open to the world right now. Do you know, the world is seeing into our churches. Digitally, yes. Do you know, they can put on YouTube or Facebook or whatever and, and open up the doors to most churches in the UK right now. They're available there. It's easy for them to walk in and, and not be seen, to just have a, have a little nosy of what's going on. But we're also open to our communities every single day. Do you know, how are we talking to our neighbours? Do we know who our neighbours are? Are we connecting with them? Are we supporting them? Are we loving them in this time? We might need to stay socially distant, but can you name your next door neighbours? Have you checked to see how they're coping right now? Are they seeing you in like living this honestly and are you honest about your vulnerabilities right now with your with your neighbors or are you trying to put on a face in the midst of this and i think that that for me is the thing that we cannot lose we've been talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and suddenly we find ourselves in a situation where all the walls that we had have been ripped down around us we are exposed to the world like if we can't come out of this authentic we i just i God is greater, yes, than, than we are totally, and God can do amazing things. But actually, I, th I just think we are giving some kind of horrific handicap to this nation in terms of engaging with God if we aren't authentic in the midst of this. Okay. So that would be my, that's my kind of big reflection yeah. on all of this right now. That's great. Uh, Andy, what, what about you? What's, uh, what, what, what's God been stirring in you in terms of this question of, uh, kind of what major shifts we might see or, or we might hope for um, in kind of church, church leadership mission? In terms of leadership, I think there's a re-emphasis on team leadership, which I think is good. I think it's a recognition that in terms of churches flourishing, we need all hands on deck and everyone to step up. And I think people are understanding that, but it's not just about it can't just be about a Sunday gathering and four or five people inputting. It has to be about the priesthood of all believers. I think that's been quite exciting to see our church mobilise a bit more for mission and also sense the urgency around that. And I think this has increasingly upped the urgency of a mission because the reality is, is that how we respond in the next few weeks or months, and we've tried to take that quite seriously with the church, could be our biggest mission opportunity in our lifetimes. I think that's very possible because there's such a spiritual hunger and desire to understand what's going on and to respond to that with questions. So I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, but I'd hope that urgency keeps going and we don't just think, right, we got through that, we shared Jesus, but now let's just, you know, play it safe and we get comfortable again. So I think it's increasing our mission endeavor. It's increasing our courageous endeavor to step out more and to share our faith as appropriate. So I think that's one thing. I think team leadership's another. I think, there's an emphasis isn't there around the fact that the core values of who you are is more important than what you do and what i mean by that is the values of what makes you you and what you're called to do is going to be what allows you to flourish or not flourish to the church yeah. so things like prayer things like sharing jesus things like gathering together community the core values of what we're seeing are either strengthening us and being the stability we need in a season or they're collapsing 
and it's given us a chance to reevaluate those values and it's interesting because really so much of what we've seen as a church has encouraged us isn't the flashy lights or the slick Sundays it's not none of that really it's the core values and principles that are I guess undergirding what we do and we're seeing ones that are really taking hold and allowing us to be stronger than ever many we can probably identify some perhaps weaknesses where we think hang on so we need to increase our pastoral care or we need to develop this in order to be more appropriate and agile in this season so that would be my reflections i think is trying to work out what is team leadership looks like this more what does the preachers of all believers look like and i think there's been a transition in the uk church generally but i think that's been increasingly the case in the last few weeks i think it's around working out our values and it's also the urgency those would be some quick thoughts i suppose brilliant uh martin same question to you uh this kind of, what shifts do you see what 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 do you see happening in church church leadership mission um, I think one of the shifts is, just following on from Andy there, is that God has given us this space where we've not been able to run our normal activities and we've realised actually, yeah, authenticity, integrity, being real before God is actually what it's, it's all about. And I think one, one of the big questions is can we declutter church life? Are there things we're doing that actually aren't part of that unique good news calling that the Spirit of God has put on our particular congregation of people? I also think we are in this digital space in a completely new way. We, we, you know, we've completely moved from a kind of a, a time when people sort of thought that um, digital meeting and conferencing was something for geeks or gamers or people who work for multinational organisations at a senior level. And we've realised, you know, it's definitely for all of us. Um, and I don't think we can leave that behind. And I think there's a huge amount of creative thinking and experimenting we need to do to say well what does this mean does it mean that we do we do we just film our old style of gathered worship in a building when we get the chance I, I, that's 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 not what we're doing now and I don't think that's the way do we go to the, do, do we actually plant uh, congregations that are digital congregations maybe that's a relatively easy kind of church plan or a kind of missional community that churches develop that is entirely predicated on a digital model um, I, I don't know but I think that the digital has got to be at the heart of this a few people have been saying you know the trouble with digital is that it, it, it pushes you away from the local and churches should be local but I've got to say that my experience of digital in recent weeks is it's made me more local than ever I've got to know the people on my street and in my town better than ever through various Facebook groups and, and connections that have been going on. And indeed, as I told a few people, we invited everyone in our street to come to worship with us in church um, a couple of weeks ago because it was easy to do that digitally in a way that we'd never actually managed to do uh, face to face. So I think there's a whole digital opportunity for us to seize. Yeah. Brilliant. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot to think through with that. And we could, there's maybe a whole other, uh, one of these round tables to sit down and have a conversation about uh, a couple of things in there. One in particular around the, the digital space and the importance of that and how we engage that into the future, not just for this minute, but also uh, what are we doing with this time? Um, uh, I, I was, uh, my wife's a doctor and I was chatting with her last night and they were, they're spending four hours today as a, a whole staff team and they're spending all of that time just asking what are we learning now what do we want to keep what do we need to change into the future they don't know when that future is going to come but they're starting now and i was just really struck that as churches if we're not starting to have those conversations now and to start to think about the kinds of things all three of you have said then we're going to be behind the eight ball we're going to miss that opportunity andy was talking about um that might come it might be three weeks away, it might be three months away, but if we're not beginning to think about it now, then we might miss that opportunity. So I guess out of all of this and all the brilliant input you've all made there, I'd be really encouraging people to listen to all of that, but to begin to think about it with your leadership teams and with your churches as you begin to process what is good now and what, what we've learned in this space, but also kind of what we want to grab from before that we definitely want to bring and what we might want to leave behind. Um, I think that's really important that people have those conversations. Well, listen, I want to wrap this up because uh, if people have stuck with us this long, we should uh, honour their time. We said about half an hour or so. So um, it, two very quick questions. Well, no, we'll do it this way. Um, first of all, is there anything you've read, watched or listened to that's been helpful to you 
uh, in this time. Uh, quick recommendations. Uh, let me go from the, uh, Martin. You go first this time. Um, if anyone has not read a Gordian long read by Rebecca Solnit, it's called Finding Hope in the Coronavirus Crisis or something. That is just excellent. It's not she's not coming from a Christian point of view, but there's a lot of you know wisdom that's obviously got its origin in in in, in the God who you know is the giver of all good gifts. Really good, Rebecca Solnit, a Gordian long read. Right. Kaz? Um, for me, I'm going to go with a, a pretty new book, John Mark Homer's Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Um, get in there first. Um, yeah, just excellent getting us to reflect on the spiritual disciplines of Sabbath, solitude, simplicity, slowing down, and what a challenge that's... Well, for me, that's actually been a challenge in this season, because we've had a lot more to do. Um, but yeah, just keeping that, that challenge of those spiritual disciplines and the importance yeah. of them. Andy? I was gonna I was gonna name that, but I will go for Francis Jan. I think it's a letter to the churches, but it's his response in terms of where we are as a church. I think it's quite prophetic in this time. Another one actually just to outstay my welcome is Phil Knox has just wrote a book about storytelling and how we share our story. And I think it's actually amazing to see how this book that was written and launched at the start of coronavirus, obviously unbeknownst to him that it'd be a start of coronavirus, but just how we share our story and how everyone's got an opportunity to tell good news of Jesus and I think it's really profound because it just unpacks some stuff around the purpose of the story why we have different stories how we share the story it's very practical but also really significant I think so what was the name of the author I didn't catch that Phil Knox Phil Knox great yeah uh great and uh seems as it's my little show I'm going to pitch one too in fact I'm going to pitch two things because Andy did that so I'm deciding I can do that uh, actually, we found there's a little book called Liturgy of the Ordinary by uh, Tish Harrison Warren, which uh, we found really helpful for our church. Um, it just looks at the everyday practicalities of life and how we can see God's life infused in them. So that's been really great from a discipleship point of view. And then um, the Mission Initiative Group also do a podcast. And uh, we've had some really great guests on there reflecting on some of this stuff. And we've actually got um, Peter Linus from the EA on this week, who's got covers some of the stuff we've talked about here, but from a very different perspective, it was pretty helpful. So those two. Okay, everyone gets a chance for no more than 30 seconds, and I will cut you off if you go over your 30 seconds. Uh, one last thought on all of this uh, that we've talked about, anything you maybe not had a chance to say, or just a final reflection. Uh, Kaz, could you lead us off with that? Um, yeah, I think for all of us church leaders, those who are involved in churches, part of this community of believers is um, our own relationships with God right now. Are we actually willing to go deeper? Was many of us have got more time, but um, what are we actually doing with that? I think that's a huge challenge for us now and going forwards Great. in that. Great. Thanks, Kaz. Uh, Andy? So I do wonder prophetically if there's a sense that Jesus is kind of clearing decks of the temple a bit at the moment and I wonder if there's a real opportunity just to sort of say what is it I guess similar to what Martin was saying around what stuff do we have to before God lay at the foot of the cross and say that's not for the future and that's stuff that's been creeping in perhaps consumeristic or unhelpful but all that has to be done on our knees in prayer what is it before God that our particular church is called to what are we called to individually but equally with, alongside that what are we ask to put aside to lay down and say actually that's not for the future and that was actually we were honest sin and unhelpful Great. and finally martin i think this is a time for boldness i was reading acts 4 peter and john are released from prison uh, they're kind of released from let's call it a lockdown and they gather together and they pray for boldness and the holy spirit fills them and they go out and proclaim the word of god we can have a timid response to this or we can have a bold response and i'm praying that it will be the latter martin brilliant all of you thank you so very much for giving up your time uh, i hope uh, if you're watching this that this has been helpful and that you've enjoyed this conversation um, if you want to carry this conversation on more, then please get in touch with us through the Baptist Union and we would love to create some more of these conversations. And if you have specific topics you want us to talk about, please get in touch and uh, we'd love to put together little panels like this to have those conversations. So uh, bless you all as you think about what God is calling us into. And if I've heard one thing re re repeated here, we must listen to God. 
And so let me encourage you, listen to God as you go forward. Thank you, Andy, Kaz, and Martin, and thank you for watching.